current position somewhere, distance to destination quite lots. Things were going fine the first few months. Life support worked, the hydroponic systems were nominal. It was exactly halfway into the voyage, let's say the problem started. An atmosphere alert woke me in my cabin. Stars were visible, we must have fallen back into normal space. I climbed into my hazard suit as per protocol, then radioed the bridge but got no reply. I ventured into the corridor. A few academics were discussing something in a huddle. What's this all about? I said. A question humans have been asking for millennia, replied a philosopher. No, I said. What's happening to the ship? There was an alarm. You should be wearing your hazard suits. A political scientist said, should is a moral prescription and you have not yet justified your authority. Had they been drinking? No, they stood up fine. We should all go to the infirmary to get checked out, I said. They followed me, but one straggler remained behind by the airlock, an astronomer. This way, please, I said. It's so big out there, he murmured, staring through the porthole. The main drive must have shut down, I said. Let's go to the infirmary, yes? What if those stars are just a projection, he murmured. They're not, I said. Or a hologram, or some classified technology we don't even know about yet. Space, I said. What if space is a hologram? Can you prove it isn't, he asked. No. Could anyone? Yes. Further empirical investigation is needed, he declared. Sure, I said. Take a stroll outside and see if that's empirical enough for you. He got into the airlock and depressurized it before I could stop him. His frozen body floated past the port window. I stared in horror for a while at his petrified dead eyes. Then the philosopher said cheerily, What if that was a hologram too? Possible, the biologist agreed. Let's run the experiment again and check for anomalies. What the f- I said, something is very wrong and you all need to come with me to the infirmary. And who are you, the captain, huh? One said. No, I said, why would I be the- Yeah, why not? I'm the captain. They exchanged a confused glance, looked me up and down, then began saluting with sincere gushings of, Sir, it's such an honor to meet you. The infirmary was bedlam, crew and academics swinging from lampshades, disassembling medical machines with hammers. I found the chief surgeon. Thankfully, she was wearing a hazard suit. Something is wrong with the crew, I said. Don't I know it, she replied. I found these three in the corridor, I said. There were four originally, but yeah. I've never seen hysteria like this. Could they be hypoxic? Oxygen is normal, she said. It's not hypoxia. I'll examine them. I brought the biologist to her. She helped him onto a table and shone a light into his eyes. Reflex is normal, she said. Pulse is good. Nurse, fetch some bananas. She peeled one and fed it to the biologist, then handed me the bunch. One in the morning, one in the evening, he'll be fine. Potassium deficiency, I said. Oh no, he's hungry. He's not hungry, I just watched one of them space themselves out of the goddamn airlock. It was then that I noticed the left glove of her hazard suit was missing. Look, I said, I really don't want to be rude, but you've clearly been exposed to whatever this is. A contagion or an ammonia leak or something. A contagion, she said. I think so. A dim flicker of sense seemed to pass over her face. She nodded and said gravely, we'll switch to emergency protocols. Perfect, I said. What do I do? Go to the galley. Yes, I said. Find the main pantry. Yes, I said. Fetch as many bananas as possible and back into the corridor and the situation was degenerating further. Full on fistfights breaking out now. Another frozen corpse passed the starboard window. The radio room was signposted, the door open. Inside, a technician was listening intently to something on headphones. And how are you feeling? I said. Oh, I'm fine, he replied. He offered me the headphones and added with a terrified stare, but there are tiny people trapped in here. I grabbed a headset. The radio frequencies were anarchy, or static, or yelling. A man at the x-ray center reported some kind of solid white parasite had infiltrated his body and he was doing his best to remove it. That's your skeleton, I said. My skeleton, he whispered. Skeleton, I said. Ella, there's no ing. Just stay there. Hopefully I can... The wail of an axle grinder rang out, followed by screaming. Then the line went dead. Someone banged on the door. I opened it to a gaggle of archivists. They stared in open horror at my hazard suit. Are you an extraterrestrial? One demanded. Sure, yeah, I said. My name is Zorbalon, and I am most displeased with your behavior of late. Do any of you have the emergency frequency code? Someone produced a piece of card with a shaking hand. Thanks, be good to each other, I said, and resealed the door. The emergency frequency was just static. I strongly considered spacing myself. At last, incredibly, a distant voice came on and said, Is someone there? Yes, I said, who's that? The narrativist, I'm on the bridge. Narrativist, I thought. That wasn't the profession on the crew roster. Are you wearing a hazard suit? I asked. No, the bridge is on a separate ventilation system. No one was affected here. Thank God. Listen, he said. Most of the bulkheads are emergency sealed, but you're at comms, right? That's not too far from ventilation. We can fix this. What do I do? I said. 
Is there a portable radio? I found one in the desk. Good, he said. Tune it to this frequency. I'll guide you. It won't take long. I unsealed the door again to 50 or so bowing crew now. Zorbalon, they cried. We have been good to each other. What is your next decree? I... Crunchy peanut butter is best, I said. Under no circumstances tolerate people who fecklessly mispronounce words. There's no ing in skeleton, no x in espresso. God's willy. They bowed lower and muttered holy chants amongst themselves. What's going on there? The man who called himself the narrativist said over the radio. It's fine. Straight down the hall then. We need the antidote first. Deck 5 and a pack of anthropologists were stripping down to their underwear and brandishing curtain poles. Excuse me, I said. What the hell is this? We demand the absolute abolition of technology, one said. This craft, its machinations, they are anti-human. This craft is the only thing keeping us alive, I said. Can you all just stay calm until I give you the antidote to all this? They screamed and raised their curtain poles. I fled. In the next corridor, a few mathematicians were climbing into mech suits. What do you think you're doing? The anthropologists have gone mad, one mathematician said. We can't have backwards ideologies infiltrating the pantheon of reason. No, it's fine, I said. It's just group hysteria. I'll fix it. And then what? She said. What if the ideas take hold? What if reason collapses entirely? Do you think killing people in the name of reason is a reasonable thing to do? I said. Primitivist heretic, she cried. They came after me too. What is this? I asked my disembodied friend on the radio. Worse than you know. What's your security clearance? A uh, janitor level, I said. What? I mean, I'm a janitor, so if you know any secrets about window cleaner, I'll keep those real good for you. He was silent a moment, then said, This isn't just a colonist ship. You don't say. It's a pacification mission. The colony world we're bound for. They've been making rebellious noises for years now. The governance thought it was time to put them in their place before a proper uprising happened. A corporal stepped out from the corridor and pointed a dagger in my direction. Have you made your bed? He screamed. Yes, I said. Have you cleaned your boots? Have you sworn allegiance to your respective sovereign territory? Ten times before breakfast, I assured him. He examined my dirty shoes, yelled, Liar! and came at me with the dagger. We played cat and mouse for a while through the CO2 filters, and I threw him off eventually. It's the logothesia, said the narrativist. The logo what? It must have gotten into the ventilation system somehow. The latest in psychological warfare. It's an airborne nanoagent. Doesn't damage the combatant, no memory loss. But, I said. But it resets their narrative frame to zero. Narrative frame? Belief structure. Then it's not working. Everyone's gone wackadoodle, I said. The gas is working fine. It was just deployed too early. I said, but how is that even a remotely useful weapon? And darkly, suddenly, it hit me. You were going to release this on the colony world when we arrived. Yes, the narrativist said. No fighting, no resistance, just complete worldview collapse. The first few minutes of inhalation are critical. The subject must be provided with a replacement narrative, else they'll invent their own, usually something ridiculous. And inventing a replacement worldview for them is your job, I suppose, I said. Mr. Narrativist. Yes. What was going to be the new narrative for the colonists, I said. Glory to the Empire, keep daft and carry on. Something like that, he said. There's not much time. The bridge and the outer ring of the ship are on a separate ventilation system. But we need to give everyone the antidote, just in case. You should be at chemical storage in a moment. Your security code should get you in. Did I mention the janitor part, I said. The computer says all the officers have fled their posts or expired. Other than me, that makes you the highest ranking person aboard. I coded the door. He was right about the sudden promotion. It slid aside. Barrels of lithium and god knows what else were piled to the ceiling. The purple canisters, that's the antidote. We'll flood the whole system with it, restore everyone's baseline ideology, he said. Just three canisters should be enough. Wheel them over to the applicator vents. They were wicked heavy, but I rolled them over as he asked. About to feed them into the ventilation system, I said, Where's the captain? Gone mad like the others. It's just you up there. There isn't time for explanations. Is the antidote connected? The ship rocked with a distant explosion. I connected the hose. All done, I said. Now what? Ventilation control is on the bridge. I'll need your retina scan for that, if you wouldn't mind coming up here. What about your clearance? I said. The system needs two staff to unlock it. Be quick, please. Things were getting violent now. Militias of mathematicians stalked the corridors, yelling that reason would save the world. A pack of anthropologists set upon them with chair legs for swords and lampshades for shields, screaming of Technopoly. I said to the radio, I thought their memory stays intact. How can they believe this nonsense? Memory isn't the problem, the narrativist said. Eat as many facts as you like. It's the digestion of those facts that matters. But surely there is always at least one correct interpretation, I said. He purred, the most seductive ideology is that you have no ideology. Isn't that kind of an ideology in itself, I said. No reply. 
I pushed on, through the swimming baths where crew were being baptized and drowned alike in the name of Zorbalon and- Wait, what's this? I said. Zorbalon has returned, they cried. Oi, are you doing a cult? I said. Yes, one replied, and drowning those who mangle pronunciations. I said to be good. You said to be good to each other, one of the crew replied. Those who make elementary pronunciation mistakes are not of our ilk. I obviously meant to be good to people in general, I said. Well, you should have been more specific in your wording. I was wrong then. No more killing, all right? Do I have to spell out every tenant of this to you? There was a long silence. Then someone said, Tenant? That's a lodger. Don't you mean tenet? Their eyes grew perplexed, then suddenly enraged. No, I said, no, no, stop that. Clambering from the water, slipping about on the tiles, they came after me. I raced out into the main atrium. The door to the bridge was blocked by berserk academics, chalk and curtain poles flying. The Zorbalonians joined the battle, fighting only with bare hands and dictionaries. Is there another way to the bridge? I yelled into the radio. Through the narrativist quarters, my friend replied. Down the main stairwell, then left. Manifestos scrawled on bulkheads in blood, iconography everywhere, deathly eddies in a single great sea of faith. Gravity felt weaker suddenly. The centrifuge must be failing. A structural integrity alarm began to ring out, then a critical oxygen level warning. I found the door and it slid aside. Stalked by chalk and chair legs, I raced in. I found myself in a boundless expanse of white mist, of marble, of opulent thrones and pauper's straw beds. Probably just a projection, but a high resolution one. On golden tables were rotting grapes. On cracked brick walls hung paintings so expensive I'd never even seen those colours and hues before. What is this? I whispered. My quarters, my friend said. Keep your head, or try. I walked in no direction. Forward, if that was forward. Passing frozen facsimiles of churches holding mass. Robed devotees prostrating before fallen prophets. I passed great mechanisms that shot refulgent beams of light into the heavens and devotees prostrated before those things too, though they wore white coats and medals about their necks. These are your quarters, I said. Just so, he replied. What I do takes a certain clarity of mind, let's say. I am afforded affordances for that. In the far distance fluttered national sigils and planetary flags, and below them marched armies, marched pilgrimages, marched robots and beggars, all of them bound for some inscrutable point in the distance so bright I couldn't look directly at it. What is all this? I said. Ideologies, he replied. All the ideologies of the empire, of every empire, superstition, scientism, all of it. Why? To do what I do, I must remain objective, he said. And the most seductive ideology is that you have no ideology. Isn't that a kind of ideology in itself, I said again. No. Narrativists are genetically engineered for ideological immunity. We're endeared in no direction, not towards our families, not against our enemies. All mythic systems are equal to us. Absolute objectivity. You believe in nothing, I said. The blind don't see black, they just don't see. I don't believe in nothing, I just don't believe. I'm neurologically incapable of it. Then you use all that objectivity to cook up new narratives, I said, to pacify rebel populations. You and your precious Logothesia. Sometimes. That's horrific. Maybe. But we are the horrors the Empire's peace is founded upon. The beggars and robots were distant now, marching at a constant pace. Many fell, perhaps from exhaustion, perhaps from despair, and their brethren trampled atop them, walking always, constantly, towards that great, blinding light. Where are they going? I whispered. To the big better, the narrativist said. To the always better. To that one right thing hidden beneath all the wrong things. God, I said. Maybe, or no God, or a final theory, or the end of all theories. The promise that tomorrow things will hurt less than today. The lights called to me, beyond language, beyond reason, towards the place where everything must be better, I hoped, where one could lay down the burden of fearing that this was all as good as it gets. Refuge from desperate uncertainty, respite from the always snapping jaws of a world that both didn't care enough and cared too much, delivery from the ancient promises that had never delivered, and I felt my body drawn in its direction, watched my feet begin to trudge towards it. You won't like that, my friend said. And sure enough, as I neared the light, my feet began to warm, then burn. I cried out, tried another route, but same again. The floor was aflame. It's a test, you see, the narrativist said. A reminder not to go near the everything promise. God, why? I said. Because deliverance is the only promise that matters, and I must be reminded daily that it is not promised to me. Narrativists are the only creatures prohibited, else we become just as ineffective and wayward as you animals. I went to rebuke him, but he said, Focus on my voice. The elevator to the bridge. It's just ahead now. Focus. 
I so desperately wanted to keep walking towards anything better than the mundane always of a future that looked like the past, of status and stasis and the oversaturated satiation of every meal only leaving one hungrier, the soporific cavalcade of atom bombs and lemonade and focus, he snapped, sense suddenly, cursedly. I watched the pilgrimage vanishing into the light, then vanish. If they had ever existed at all, they were gone now. The elevator was just ahead. It span up, and there, in its glittering majesty, was the bridge. A bald man of indeterminate age was sat in a captain's chair, looking out on the stars. How do you do, he said, with the voice of my friend. You can take your hazard suit off now. I think I'll keep it on for a while, just in case. As you like, he said. His face betrayed no emotion, elated as a rock, his eyes watching the galaxies in perfect indifference of their grandeur. The oxygen alarm began to grow more urgent. I glanced at the system status. Why is the main computer disabled, I said. It controls life support. Safety measure, he replied. Your retinal print, please. I looked into the scanner. It seemed to accept my eyes. Doesn't the system need your retina too, I said. He ignored this, only bowed deeply in gratitude. Distant fans began to whir as the bridge filled with fogs of gas. There, he said. The nanoagent should be making its way across the entire ship now. The antidote, you mean, I corrected. Antidote, he said, academically. From the Greek, didonai, to give, and anti, against. Literally, to give against. Okay, I said. What is this antidote giving against, though, do you imagine? Um, I said. Through the bridge door, I saw the great armies still fighting, beating one another into submission. Will they stop that soon? If we give them a reason to, the narrativist replied. Okay? The oxygen alarm blared louder. In any case, we need to turn the main computer back on now, otherwise we'll suffocate. He took another large breath, sighed favorably, then murmured. When I was young, my mother told me that the stars were angels' eyes watching over us. Yeah, but they're not, I said. Turn the main computer back on, please. When I was young, my father told me the oceans were the tears of gods, tears they cried upon seeing how beautiful their worlds were. Maybe, I said, it might all just be water, about the computer. But when I looked, there was no magic to be found. The world was but blueprints and protons and mud. What a thing, prohibited from belief. He took another gulp of air and looked terribly satisfied. But I see it now, or I believe that I believe I do. To look upon the cosmic eyes that watch, to staunch the cosmic tears that fall. The armies only grew more incensed in their fighting. The oxygen alarm began to ring desperately. There never was an antidote, I said, realizing now. It depends what you consider an antidote, he replied. And now the logothesia is everywhere, and you're breathing it too. Why? They locked me out of ventilation control halfway through the procedure. How lucky then that I found you. You're out of your mind, I said. A matter of perspective. Some things are beyond perspective. Nothing is, he said. Walk left of here, 400 years, and you'll reach a planet where the inhabitants worship a bronze centaur, forever pacified by the thought of his return, and they are happy for that. Walk right of here, 700 years, and you'll reach a planet where the inhabitants only worship themselves, cities of mirrors they can barely tear themselves from, and there's no time for war or uprising, and they are happy for that. I did these things, manufactured a stillness of their hearts, but a torture accompanied it, a stillness that I could not believe, as an author barred from reading his own work. It was too much, their stupid smiling faces, their opiate bliss. It's a wonder you don't all go mad from joy with the narrative tricks you play on yourselves. My God, I said, you wanted to know what belief is, and you've sabotaged the entire voyage for that. This is a new voyage, he said. We're going inwards. Not without oxygen, I said. Not if the ship is in bits. You know belief ends where data begin, right? That was the old way, he said. We're going to try a new one. No, I said. The crew didn't agree to this. Daydreams of grandia won't do it. And he said, but isn't beauty truth and truth beauty? And I said, nothing pretty about cow shit, but that's real too. And he said, six blind men only know one part of the elephant. And I said, but there is still an elephant. And he said, half a truth is often a great lie. And I said, yeah, and sometimes it isn't. And he said, but surely there's more truth in deception than faithful tellings could ever muster. And I said, no, and I don't even think that's a quote. Some stuff is real, otherwise it's just lying. Oxygen is real, as is how we're running out of it now. Your belief that isn't happening will do very little to change that. Give me control of the damn computer or we'll suffocate inside of an hour. He ignored this completely, said, you're wrong. 
Belief is the foundation of reality. No, I said. Reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. And do you believe that? He asked. Of course. Ah, then you do start with belief. Oh God, this is pointless. I said. You'll say anything to be right. And he said, What if humans don't need oxygen at all? That we're smarter and purer for breathing nothing? I can't argue with you if you aren't even willing to concede the most basic facts about reality. Why would I lie about this? Who do you think I'm working for? Big oxygen. I'm begging you to come back to truth, lest you break the world for all of us. And he said, "Truth is what your contemporaries let you get away with." And I said, "But I'll bet none of them deny the existence of gravity. There are facts." And he said, "Facts? The devil can cite studies for his purpose." And I said, "Then I guess the devil has basic scientific literacy. You're just a misanthrope with a thesaurus. I'm sorry you're having some kind of megalomaniacal personal crisis, but don't drag us all into it. We're alone in space. We only have each other. If we don't do something, you're gonna kill us all, and then there'll be no one left." To believe in anything, believe that at least. He reached for the bridge console. Our bearing began to change. The stars swiveling. What are you doing? The stars settled again. Our new course set. We were pointed into a patch of boundless black. He started prodding at the pseudo space controls. There's nothing out there, I said. Not for thousands of light years ahead. Where are we going? Beyond, he said. There's enough logothesia on board for a whole planet. We'll use as much as we need, and each day we'll breathe it in and start our beliefs anew. The pseudo space generator began to come to life, sending a shudder through the hull, beginning our acceleration. I said, "Please don't be a child. We all live here, and we're almost out of time." Time, he said. On Monday we'll believe in dragons. On Tuesday we'll decry superstition. Wednesday we'll assert the purity of love. Thursday the catharsis of hate. On Friday we'll believe in everything. Saturday nothing. And on Sunday we'll rest. Too fast then, approaching hypergeometry. The struts began to buckle. Portholes began to crack. Trembling with blueprints pushed well beyond the limits by an incompetent pilot. And above the blinking warning lights of the control panels, of the wailing of danger sirens, there the narrativist floated, his nose pushed to the glass of the bridge, waiting for that great beyond, whether invented or discovered. You've killed us all, I said, and like the incompetent scorpion on the frog's back, you're drowned too. The acceleration was becoming too much. The crush of G-forces pushing blood from the brain and sense from the senses as we approached oblivion. And there, on the floor, below the fog of befuddling gas, before the promise of coming death, I lay down in defeat, for there was nothing left to do. And then there was only nothing. I woke to the narrativist standing over me. The maniac was taking my helmet off. What are you doing? I shouted. He said, "Unbounded from your nutshell, you may now count yourself a king of infinite space." I held my breath, but it was too late. My lungs stung already. The logothesia rewriting me down to the brainstem. My mind, I said. I repeated my name over and over, anything to hold on to, until it suddenly seemed strange to me I had a name at all. Are we dead? I said. Quite the opposite, he replied. We're going on an adventure. The bridge door was open. The narrativist beckoned ahead. It's not safe out there, I said. Isn't it? What do you see? Anarchy, hate, death, I said. I think you're wrong. I see a grand party in our honor. And slowly, I began to see it too. He led me into the corridor. The chromium panels of the ship were gone, replaced with curtains and drapes, elegant and opulent. Is this real? I said. Is anything? But the oxygen, I said weakly. Oxygen levels vary naturally, he said. But I feel like they're about to vary really badly. Isn't that a fact? We're going beyond oxygen, beyond facts. All your life, you've been tyrannized by so-called facts. But I ask you, what if the world were as we wish it to be? What if red was blue and five was two plus two? What if those aren't fights amongst the crew but dances? What if all the oxygen is evacuated from the ship and we find we have been lied to our entire lives by the powers that be, and that brains actually function better without air, like a brave fish out of water, or Samson finding he is only stronger without his hair? What if that terrible shuddering is not the miscalibrated pseudo space generator about to explode as we jump to pseudo space, but an orchestra tuning? Up for the greatest symphony ever played, and you and I find ourselves the guests of honor there. The stars began to dissolve, everything fading to diaphanous hypergeometry as pseudo space embraced us. Our course poorly set, but perhaps none of that mattered now. And my friend said, "What if we were never on a voyage, but instead attending a great and grand ball of infinite plenty? What if we can eternally play make believe, thereby delaying the end of the world? If we only believe hard enough that the world isn't ending?" What if you and I are destined to ride in unfettered bespoke figure eights upon noble beasts on limitless beaches, pushed softly on by the wind of the truths we create?